We know that the prospect of the end of criminal prosecutions will be difficult for some to accept, and this is not a position that we take lightly. But we have come to the view that this is the best way to help Northern Ireland move further along the road to reconciliation. I don't buy that it's solely to protect the troops or to protect their servicemen. I honestly believe that it's more to do with covering up their dirty war that they fought within Northern Ireland. It's sick to the pit of my stomach that we are now find ourselves in this situation, that a, a government wants to equate terrorists with uh, those who held to the rule of law, that, that somehow wants to give a bye to terrorist atrocities. Decades of violence, thousands of people murdered and injured in deadly bombings and shootings. Thankfully, that's now over, but just how to confront the pain of our violent past and give victims and survivors what they need to heal and to feel that justice has been achieved is now a huge issue. Boris Johnson and his government controversially believe that all the problems can be solved by granting an amnesty which would apply equally to police, paramilitaries and soldiers. The proposals would ride roughshod over what was agreed at Stormont House and mean an end to troubles inquests. They would also lead to a ban on all criminal prosecutions related to the conflict. The PSNI and the police ombudsman would be legally barred from investigating troubles related crimes. The Westminster government's plans have been unanimously rejected, not just by the political parties here, but more importantly by those who have lost loved ones. The Irish government is not happy with them either. And the United Nations have described what's on offer as a blanket impunity for the grave human rights violations committed during the Troubles. My mother's last words were, why us? Seamus MacDonald's parents, Mervyn and Rosaline, were both murdered by the UFF. They were killed at their home on the Longlands Road in Newton Abbey on July the 10th, 1976. It was dinner time. Seamus was just two. My father came in from the back kitchen and one of the men produced a machine gun and the other one produced a hand pistol and they proceeded to shoot my father. Um, after they'd killed my father, um, they then killed my mother after taking me from my mother, put me on the sofa and then they killed her as well. Um, I know even in the context of the troubles that to not leave one parent alive was a particularly cruel and harsh. What did you lose that night and, and your sister? Everything. Um, whoever I was meant to be in life with my parents uh, died that day along with my mother and father. No one was ever prosecuted for the double murder. The only other investigation that I did push for, hoping that it would bring some kind of information to light, was with the HET, but it actually caused more harm than good. The Reverend Alan Irwin's father, Thomas, and his uncle Fred are both buried here in the Church of Ireland graveyard in Six Mile Cross in County Tyrone. The two brothers were part-time UDR soldiers. Fred was murdered by the IRA in Dungannon in 1979. Seven years later, Alan's father was shot at point-blank range while at his work outside Oma. He'd been sitting that morning at breakfast and he, he had said that there had been a threat the, the night before had been relayed, but he went to work the next day uh, as normal. And then about, I think around half two or so, uh, that time of day, then he was uh, shot as he was working at the Mountfield Treatment Works. Uh, terrorist or terrorists uh, walked in, called out his name, as far as I'm aware, and then shot him. What was the effect, or what continues to be the effect, um, on your family of what was done to your family? I think it's the fact that we, at the time, were promised uh, that no stone would be left unturned, that we promised that these uh, individuals would be brought to justice, and all of that just seemed to be just mere words. It's that sense of justice that we're looking for now, that we still look for 
uh, in the present that someone will be held to account or at least someone we know who carried out the atrocity will be brought to justice. In their proposals, the government speak of achieving reconciliation in the shorter and longer term while delivering ideas put forward in the Stormont House Agreement. Allen believes there can be no reconciliation if perpetrators don't acknowledge that what they did was wrong. When we talk about reconciliation, uh, what are we reconciling? But as victims, we are continuously terrorised every day, a different form of terrorism. When we have those apologists who, who stand up and eulogise terrorists, who glorify terrorists, you know, that's terrorising their victims over and over again. You know, so are, what are we trying to reconcile? Good with evil without repentance and remorse and retribution? It can't be done. Exactly 33 years ago today, Shan Dalton died when an IRA booby-trapped bomb exploded in Kildrum Gardens in Derry's Craigan Estate. Shan's wife Polly had died just five weeks earlier. Sheila Lewis was also killed instantly in the blast and Gerard Curran died seven months later from his injuries. Concerned about a neighbour who had not been seen in a few days, they went into the flat and unwittingly triggered the bomb that killed them. They had been unaware that the man living in the flat had been abducted by the IRA. My daddy was full of life, full of fun. Um, he would have thought nothing about dressing up and, and entertaining guests. He taught all the young fellas and the, and, and the girls to play football in the street. His love of dancing, he taught us all how to dance. We all stood on his feet and he taught us how to dance. What's been the effect of his murder on your family, Phyllis, would you say? Well, the effect has been devastating for our family. There's been unbearable pain. Um, and we have had, you know, no answers um, in terms of truth and justice for my father. And his voice was taken from him. So we feel a responsibility that we must fight to vindicate him. Shan's family believe the RUC knew there was a bomb in the area six days before he died. They claim the police did nothing about it to protect an informant. A police ombudsman's report in 2013 concluded that the police failed to warn the public about possible IRA activity in the area, but said there was no evidence police were protecting an agent. However, the ombudsman says his investigation had been hampered by both the refusal of a number of retired police officers, some formerly of senior rank, to cooperate and by the loss of investigation documentation. We do believe that there is evidence out there that will prove that there was a state, a, a state agent involved in the death of my father and we would like the answers to that. And that's why the family wants a new inquest? Yes. We want a new inquest because the coroner can compel the state forces to give evidence uh, at, at a coroner's report or an inquest. But the Dalton family have huge concerns about the British government's plan. I think if Boris Johnson and Brandon Lewis get these proposals through, that they're effectively closing down the shutters on any opportunity for us to seek or to get truth and justice for my father. And if it does go through, you know, he's got an 80 majority there in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. Where will that leave you, do you think, as a family? Currently, we're appealing the court for the, a new inquest. It would be doubtful if we would get a new inquest then, and that would leave our family that we wouldn't have the answers that we need. 1972, the worst year of the Troubles. 479 people were killed and nearly 5,000 injured. One Sunday night that year, after the breakdown of a ceasefire between the army and the IRA in Lenadoon in Belfast, five families' lives would change forever when the army then moved into the Spring Hill and West Rock areas. We want our day in court like Bala Murphy. We want our loved ones declared innocent. Among those hundreds who lost their lives in 72 was Natasha Butler's grandfather, Patrick Butler, who was 38. 
Patrick was one of five people, including three teenagers and a priest, to be killed by the army on the 9th of July 1972. Patrick, a father of six, and Father Noel Fitzpatrick were killed, it's believed, by the same bullet fired by the army. The poor had gone to help others who had been shot and wounded by soldiers. The other three victims were John Dougal, Margaret Gargan and David McCafferty. At the time, the army claimed to have come under attack from the IRA, but local people insisted the only shots fired were by the army from Corrie's timber yard nearby. This atrocity, which happened just six months after Bloody Sunday and less than a year after Bally Murphy, is now known as the Forgotten Massacre. Almost half a century on, this family's campaign continues. All we want for our loved ones is our loved ones' names cleared because the official record by the British government is that night they murdered five IRA gunmen when all they were doing was out to help the community and we will continue fighting regardless of how long it takes. Even after his death, the Butler family say they continued to suffer at the hands of soldiers. Because he was painted as a gunman, like our lives were turned upside down. Every time a new regiment came in, our house was raided. Um, our house was trashed. We were trailed out of bed at two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, my mother was questioned, stood up and questioned by whatever sergeant was there. Robert, I looked up to um, as a kind of a hero figure. Robert was uh, um, outdoorish. He was he was strong of stature, tall and lean, athletic. Um, he knew his own mind. Um, he played in a little rock band here in the town with some other fellas, friends of his. He just was a, a person who loved life and, and had a great humour. It's almost 50 years now since Shane Laverty's eldest brother, Constable Robert Laverty, was murdered by the IRA in North Belfast. Robert, a passenger in a police vehicle, was shot in the head by two gunmen as he travelled up the Antrim Road on July the 16th, 1972. The 18-year-old, originally from Ballycastle, had been in the RUC for just eight months. My mum um, had her heart torn that day. I mean, Daddy died ten years before. That was a big enough wrench, left with seven children. I remember years upon years where my, I would come home and my mum would be crying, and she was crying because of Robert's death. A HET inquiry took place into Robert's murder, but for the family it was far from satisfactory. They might as well have handed us um, a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. It didn't give us really any hard and secure answers about what happened. Such as? Um, such as, um, OK, so there was a gun used in, in my brother's murder and it was, it was discovered a few weeks later being transported by a female after it had been used in another attack. Now that female was never questioned about my brother's incident. This is Shane's first television interview, and he's only doing it because of his outrage at what Westminster is proposing. Is it amnesty or is it amnesia? I often think, you know, it's very strategic forgetfulness because it's not that these, these people, um, they're, they're certainly not innocent. Someone sent them out to do these things. And um, to my mind, people must be answerable. Murder is murder is murder. Evil does not dissipate over time. Evil perpetrated a hundred years ago is still evil today. It's wrong and it has to be um, treated in that way. From my heart I'm saying to the Prime Minister of this country, you need to step back and you need to think. Dealing with our past is never going to be easy. Many think the proposals in the Stormont House Agreement on legacy are still the best way forward. But seven years on from that agreement, there's still no sign of the proposed historical investigations unit that would have examined unsolved murders. Nor is there any move to establish the envisaged Independent Commission on Information Retrieval. It was meant to allow people to find out more about what happened to their loved ones. Now Westminster, in its proposals, speaks of a new independent information recovery body, citing the example of what happened in South Africa as a potential way forward. You don't know how your greatness would be enhanced if you were to say sorry. Things 
went wrong. Forgive me. I beg you. I am saying it is true. Things went horribly wrong. Its Truth and Reconciliation Commission had three components. The first was where victims told their story and we tried to catalogue a record of what happened. The second was an amnesty process, so the amnesty process was built into that commission. But what was key to the South African approach was that you could only get amnesty if you were deemed to tell the truth about what happened. So that was the, the unique part, controversial part, but the unique part of the South African Truth Commission. And then the third part of the commission looked at the issue of reparations. Brandon believes that some of what took place in South Africa could work here. Elements like uncovering the truth and giving victims a space to tell their story. But Brandon believes that what he calls the blanket amnesty being proposed by Boris Johnson simply will not work. The amnesty in South Africa actually was time limited. You had a few years to apply for it and you had to have committed acts which were determined in a certain way within legislation between a certain time period. And if you didn't apply during that time period, you could be prosecuted afterwards. What's being proposed in Northern Ireland is essentially just one big fat carrot. It's basically saying uh, we're going to stop all uh, uh, investigations and, and prosecutions um, and we hope then that you'll come forward and uh, meet victims or tell your uh, side of the story. The government, with its majority of 80 MPs, may well be able to push this highly controversial legislation through Parliament. But Boris Johnson and Brandon Lewis must know that the road ahead will not be straightforward. Legal challenges are highly likely. And the line that the Prime Minister hopes he can draw under dealing with our brutal past may not be just so neat. It's not the victims that are keeping us tied to the past, it's the system that's keeping us tied to the past. We'll continue fighting because the truth does need to be told. I suppose some are maybe delighted that this is happening because it means that terrorists will now never have to face a court of law. What kind of president are they setting if they can just draw a line under mass murder and forget about it? We don't feel that there will ever be a conviction, um, but we want truth and justice. From a victim's perspective, this type of a proposal essentially robs them of all forms of power. The views of five families there on the people they lost in the Troubles and their thoughts on what the Prime Minister is proposing. And if you've been affected by the issues raised in that report, you can find support and advice from the Victims and Survivors Service. Details of how to contact them are on your screen. Nula Olone, we saw in the report uh, the pain of those people. Brandon Hamber summed it up at the end. If these proposals go through, the victims and survivors will lose any bit of power that they feel they have. Mm -hmm. I think he's absolutely right. I think that the, um, the critical thing for the victims is that there are legal processes which they can use to find out what happened to their loved ones. And what the government are proposing is to remove all those legal rights, and just in one go, to remove the right to criminal prosecution and investigation, the right to inquests, the right to inquests, which is one of the most ancient rights in our civilization, and the right to bring civil action in respect of the loss which they suffered. And with that, I think when you take all those things away, goes hope, because no information recovery system such as is described in the legacy proposals will actually um, be able to uh, secure the information which would be secured by investigation with proper powers. Waiting for people to tell you what happened is not going to be as effective as doing, for example, DNA profiling, um, ca ca um, gathering up biometrical evidence about people, um, investigating through uh, arrests, uh, searches and seizures. All that is going to be lost. And I do not believe that the information recovery system will work for the benefits of the victims. It will not recover evidence in the way in which investigation does. South Africa, it didn't happen either. Come to that later. Um, Lord Dannett, uh, thank you for joining us on the programme. What do you make of these proposals from the, from the British government? Surely our report shows that they are so far away from what any of the victims and survivors want. Uh, yes, but I think you uh, <clears throat> quite rightly say that they are proposals. 
They are proposals that the government is going to put forward uh, for debate in the House of Commons and for debate uh, in the House of Lords. And I'm sure Baroness Alone will make her points, as I will, uh, in debate in the House of Lords. And it may well be that uh, the proposals the government is tabling uh, get amended, uh, if not in the Commons, uh, by the House of Lords. After all, there's got to be a consensus on on which way the government goes forward on this. But given what we've uh, heard, interested... given what we've heard from people in that report, there would need to be quite some amending to make those people even content, if not happy. Yes, I don't think they will be content or happy. I think it's a tragedy that um, 30, 40, 50 years on, there are still many unsolved murders <clears throat> and horrific attacks relating to Northern Ireland. <clears throat> but of course, I would also observe that your package, unless I missed something, didn't focus on uh, any soldiers, soldiers' families. Over 700 lost their lives in the province. And I think there is an, a realization that if the criminal justice system has failed to answer the questions 30, 40, 50 years on, it's most unlikely they're going to answer those questions now. And therefore, the statute of limitations that is proposed is what I would call, and I've called before, a least worst option. But at least Many people um, here, Lord Dannett, see it as an attempt to bury dirty tricks of the past. Yes, you can, can portray it many ways, but you've asked me for my opinion, and my opinion is that it's the least worst option, but it will actually have the effect, as far as veteran soldiers are concerned, the vast majority of whom carried out their duties for 38 years in Northern Ireland, totally within the law. It will give them freedom from the knock on the door and further questioning that's been going on and threatening in quite an aggressive way many veterans over many years. Um, the pursuit of truth is important, but and truth through justice is the best way. The system has currently failed to solve some of these issues through the justice system. So going through a truth recovery method by an alternative, along with a statute of limitations, is, as I say, the least worst way to go forward. But it's better than the stasis of nothing, which is what is characterising what is going on in Northern Ireland at the present moment. Well, let's move on to yourself, Professor Louise Mallander from Queen's University. What do you make of these proposals from the British government? Are they even legal? Well, I think, firstly, I treat these proposals as an amnesty law. I'm aware the command paper uses the term statute of limitations, but statute of limitations are particular legal tools that are designed to allow ample time and opportunity for investigations to be carried out, only after which point is there a, a, a legal bar brought to any further legal proceedings. I think it's clear from the package we just watched that many families have not had ample opportunity to have their cases investigated. And this proposal would bring an immediate automatic end to the whole range of possible legal remedies as Nula has outlined. And so from my perspective, what's on the table is a broad, unconditional amnesty. And so thinking about the legality of that, I think it's well known that the, under the European Convention on Human Rights, Articles 2 and 3, the uh, protections for the right to life and freedom from torture, require that the be investigations and it sets out standards for what those investigations should be. They should be effective, transparent, prompt and independent. So there's quite a high threshold of what this should happen. Do you, not, do you think there's some uh, non-realisation within the British government? Do they not realise that you know standards have to be kept up? Well, I mean, that's a broader question beyond just the legacy debate, I think, when we talk about Brexit and different approaches to international law. Now, as a law professor, I think it's, it's centrally important that these standards are upheld. I think it's important for how governments are held to account. I think it's important for people having legal security around their rights. And I also think it's important for the UK's place on the international stage and how it engages with other countries. But I think these proposals would not be legal because they rule out investigations. And even with that, the European Convention creates some space for amnesties if they meet two conditions under the Tarbo case. Firstly, that they're necessary. That's a high bar. That's thinking about amnesties that are needed to prevent further violence, to protect lives. That's not what we have here in democratic rule of law state. Prosecutions won't, do, won't undermine people or threaten people's lives. The other th criteria is that there should be a respect for the, need, the rights of victims in society. And I think listening to that package, somehow, at, at times that respect, respect is felt sorely lacking, I think, here in the policy making process. Nilo Olone, um, Boris Johnson, Brandon Lewis, they talk about drawing a line under this, um, of course. Can such a thing be done or can any sort of consent even be found to try and uh, plod a path forward? 
Um, I think consent can be found to, to plot a path forward. I think that all the proposals, all the initiatives which we've seen over the years have proposed um, some form of historical investigations, um, some form of memorialization, some form of truth recovery, etc. So what is happening here is that the government are going with elements of what has been agreed in the past, as recently as 2020 in the New Decade New Approach Agreement, and removing from that package any hope of, of prosecution. I listened to Lord Dannett with care, but with respect, he says, for example, that you know, been, the, the prosecution process has failed. Let's just think for one minute about Operation Canova, which started off as the, uh, the investigation of uh, allegations related to the agent known as Steak Knife. Um, and then uh, the team investigating those allegations were asked to look at the murder in October 1982 of three RUC officers, Paul Ham Hamilton, Alan McCloy and Sean Quinn. And then they were asked to review the activities of the Glenarn gang. Um, now, it, that means that Canova has been investigating more than 200 murder cases, which is, extend over a period of 25 years. Having done that, they submitted cases. There are now 30, 31 or 32 files before the Director of Public Prosecutions. The earliest of those files went in in 2019. There have been no decisions from the Director of Public Prosecutions, and we're told there'll be no decisions until 2022. Now, you can't have prosecutions unless the Director of Public Prosecutions makes a decision to prosecute. There is not the resources being put into this. If the resources were put into it, prosecutions would be possible. These are not... These are not, you know, harassment of British troops. Lord Dunnett referred to those who served honourably. This is about establishing what did happen here and learning from the past. Lord Dunnett, what do you say to that from Nero alone? Well, you can always pick out cases, and very strong cases too, which undermine the generality of what a statute of limitations is trying to suggest. And I'm afraid I speak up for a very large number, hundreds of thousands of British Army veterans who served faithfully according to the law in Northern Ireland, who are frankly fed up with the continuing suggestion that all soldiers are killers and murderers and are due to be investigated. Okay. We've got to be fair to our British soldiers, British troops, who did their best to fight for Northern Ireland to remain as the government wished as think, part of this country during the period of the Troubles. I think no so I'm wants afraid to... bringing individual cases undermines the generality of a very legitimate point of view, which says, let's draw a line and let veterans retire with dignity and not have their former service hung around their necks. But isn't the reality is that this is a, a Tory pledge in the manifesto from a couple of years ago to get rid of what they call these vexatious cases? Of course it's a Tory pledge. It could be a Labour Party pledge. Frankly, any responsible government needs to look at what it's asked of its armed forces to do and ask whether it is reasonable and fair 30, 40, nearly 50 years later, still to be exposing them to investigations, most of which will turn out to be unfounded, as we have found with overseas operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Frankly, the military community is fed up with this. And, and wrongdoing, wrongdoing other, by anyone, find, surely soldiers, no matter who, it should be pursued. Wrongdoing should be pursued. And if we can't do it through the justice, through the justice process. Do you accept, though, that wrongdoing by soldiers should be pursued? Of course. But that is the minority, the very small minority of cases. The vast majority of soldiers got up in the morning to do their duty. The vast majority of terrorists got up in the morning for death uh, and murder. And that's a very sharp distinction. And we should not lose it when we get wrapped up in the bad things that happened, such as Bally Murphy uh, and Bloody Sunday. OK. Back to yourself, Louise Manler. I'll come to you back in a, uh, in a wee second. Nula. Uh, Louise, from your, from your point of view, um, how, how does what's being proposed, how does it compare to other things across the world? Well, in my research over a number of years, I've compiled a database of all the amnesties I could find since 1945. There's over 650 at the moment in my database. And I've looked particularly at amnesties relating to conflict and peace processes between since 1990 and 2016. So that's a sample of about 289 amnesties in all parts of the world. And I think it's safe to say that what the UK is proposing would make the UK very much an outlier on the international stage. So, for example, it's quite rare for amnesties to be granted to state actors 
actors. Only 25% of the amnesties that I've looked at from 1990 cover state actors. Mostly, they cover them alongside amnesties for non-state actors, only 5% for the state altogether. It's quite rare to grant unconditional amnesty in the form that's been proposed here. Only 37% of amnesties do. It's highly unusual to exclude no crimes at all, which is the case here. And um, I could find only 6% of amnesties that explicitly exclude civil remedies. I couldn't find any that prevented inquests or other forms of investigations. So this, this, mm. so this sounds pretty unique. Very briefly, Nula, just some comment on what you've been hearing there from Lord Dannett. Yeah, um, I think the first thing I must say is that nobody is saying that all soldiers who came to Northern Ireland were killers. I think that's a, it, it just damages the case that Lord Dannett's trying to make. Um, we accept that many, many soldiers who came to Northern Ireland served faithfully and properly. There's no question about that. Um, but these cases which are being investigated, if they were vexatious cases, they would not go to prosecution. Therefore, the prosecutors, the investigators know that there's no purpose in starting on an investigation which is vexatious. What they need to do is get new evidence if there's new evidence to be found. And if that evidence is found, the rule of law requires that it be placed before a court. So I think that, that really what Lord Dannett is saying is just let us go away in peace and forget about the victims and forget about the voices of those whom we heard. Well, of course, uh, we know that feelings run deep on this and mm. uh, the uh, discussions will continue. Welcome back to Justice in Jeopardy, and I'm joined by the victim's campaigner, Alan McBride, Dennis Bradley, one half of the Eames Bradley Initiative, and Baroness Nula Olone is still with us. Alan McBride, a good day today for victims with the opening finally of the pension scheme. Yes, as of uh, 12 noon today, earlier, uh, many, many hundreds of injured victims and survivors will be able to apply for the injured pension. Uh, it's been a long time coming, uh, from 2009 actually, we started campaigning just on the back of the Eames Bradley report, which in my view is the best uh, report to deal with the past to date. Um, uh, so we started campaigning just, just after the launch of that report. Um, we've been up and down the storm so many times. We were in first name terms with the security staff and with the catering staff. Um, I'm a devolutionist uh, and I uh, was very much um, disappointed when the assembly fell. Uh, but when it did fall, it gave us the opportunity to take the, the, the fight for the pension to Westminster because, quite frankly, uh, we were going around in circles here uh, with regards to it, as we do quite often when it comes to legacy. Uh, we took it over to Westminster, and it was with the intervention of people like Lord Peter Hain, uh, who came in and who supported uh, the pension, that we finally got it over the line. But that was uh, way back uh, the 29th of May last year, um, and yet it has taken to this year uh, for that to be come into, into practice. So, you know, it, it, it's a good thing for many, many injured victims and survivors, but of course it's a sad day for others. I'm aware that uh, there were five of our guys uh, that uh, didn't make it, that died along the way. Um, and if that scheme had been over the line whenever we were up at Stormont, when we were wanting Sinn Féin the DUP to do it and couldn't do it, uh, well then those people would have been, at least we would have had a couple of years of the pension. So it's a bittersweet day, I suppose, for, for, for those families, um, but delighted that we finally, finally got it. It's a good news story. I, I, I think it should be a film, to be honest with you. I think it's just an incredible story. Yeah. Moving to the legacy proposals from the Westminster government, what do you make of them? Well, they're unacceptable. Uh, they're unacceptable not only to me and my family, but they're unacceptable to victims and survivors, the length and breadth of these islands. Um, the one thing, ironically, that has probably united the victim sector and has been a very divided sector since I've been working on it um, is their opposition to these proposals. Uh, just to take away, uh, you know, the very hope that families had of, of, of any sense of justice um, or truth recovery, I, I think is immoral. Uh, I think it sends out a very powerful message and a very wrong message that what happened to your loved one doesn't matter and that the people that went out to kill them, uh, that that doesn't matter either. Um, I don't think it is a society we should be saying that. And that's not to say, by the way, that, that, that families had any real hope or real expectation that you would see uh, people going to, to, to jail for you know periods of time or, or whatever. Um, you know, But they did want to at least have that as an option if, it, if, it, if there was enough evidence around to, to, to bring that about. Um, to take it off the table um, with inquests and all that goes with it, um, I, I just think is immoral. I think it, it, it drives a, a horse and cart through human rights legislation and, and it's wrong. And, and if the British government are serious and honest about the fact that they're in listening mode um, and everybody is telling them, bar their, uh, the, the veterans, if everybody is telling them that this is wrong, then they need to listen. Okay. Dennis uh, Bradley, um, what do you think needs to happen next? Well, the past, unfortunately, uh, has become a bit of a swamp and every proposal that is put forward uh, falls into that swamp. One of the reasons that happens is because 
quite often the proposals are, <coughs> are partial proposals. Uh, they take one side or the other, or one of the many sides. And unfortunately, that loses trust. And the amount of trust that's left, is, there is no trust left. Uh, and there's particularly no trust left, I think, with the Conservative Party because they became particularly partisan around this. And they are, they are, they're responding to the veterans to their own constituency rather than the totality of this constituency. Can that trust uh, be rebuilt, do you think? Well, I think it can only be rebuilt if you go back to one of the core proposals of the consultative group in the past, which became known as the Ames Bradley Report, which said that you have to set up a very small legacy commission who will actually handle this, uh, who will take care of this, and who will provide most of the information or get their hands on most of the, all of the information and provide most of the information to those who seek it and while keeping open the very possibility and the the, the, the reducing possibility that people will actually get into court uh, because as we can see from the last decisions of the DPP that's becoming that's becoming almost impossible uh, at, at this stage. And we know, but, Dennis, that for many victims, getting information is simply not enough. They want more in some cases. Well, that's actually questionable. Sometimes people talk about getting information or getting to the truth when, or getting justice when what they really mean is, is wanting to know actually what happened. Uh, the number of people who will say that and then say things like, I don't necessarily want to see anybody going to jail. Sometimes there are contradictions within that, and that's okay, that's totally understandable because people are hurt and have been hurting for a long period of time. And I think that the way this has been handled this has been so insensitive. Uh, has been so partial, has been so just within within the remit of the Conservative Party, and particularly a small group within the Conservative Party, that has been quite outrageous. When in fact there was an opportunity to widen it out and to make it much more substantial and embraceive and include all the people, because there there are a lot of voices within the victims' communities, but there's a lot of people who who don't have a voice within the victims' community, and those people I think are being totally marginalised within this this situation. So I. Think I think that the, the gathering of trust can only be if you actually set up something which people can say, well, we think that will be impartial, that that will embrace the totality of what has to be seen here uh, and do it over a period of time. A statute of limitation, by the way, has a place within this, but it has a place when you've done as much work as you can possibly do. Dennis, I want to get to Nula Olone again here. Um, trust, information, recovery, all of these words. But at the heart of many of these cases, Nula Olone, Collusion? Yes. Yes, collusion is definitely part of the story which must be told ultimately. Um, we're not saying there's collusion in every case. In some cases it was simply paramilitary perpetrators who killed people. But the reality is if we look, for example, at the Canova investigation, which is looking at the activities of the uh, agent steak knife, we now have 30 files gone to the Director of Public Prosecutions in respect of 17 murders and I think 12 abductions, kidnapping type things. If we look at the Glenarm gang review, um, we're talking about 126 murders. If we look at my own um, police ombudsman work, the UVF in, in North Belfast, we're completely infiltrated by the state. So how um, do you square the circle of all of this in terms of trying to get to any kind of truth? I, you know, I think what you do is you trust the processes which have evolved in our country over centuries. And I think that, uh, I mean, I'm fully with everybody else that we need investigation. I don't think we need to bring um, people in from across the world. I think that will slow things down. I think we need a power of investigation like the Canova investigation, which is running. There's been a victims focus group report on Canova. The victims themselves have said it, it meets their needs very good. There's an independent human rights analysis by the new um, Chief Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, very, very um, complimentary of the fact that it's Article 2 compliant and why it's Article 2 compliant. And I think that is what people are entitled to under the law. And I think for government to turn around and say, well, it doesn't matter, you can forget about it. You know, we need to move on. You cannot, in justice, expect to build a state on the denial of truth. OK. Alan McBride, when you listen to that um, and you know what the government is proposing, uh, do you think these proposals will be um, changed in any way? Uh, I think those that commentate on these matters would suggest not. The Tory party have such a huge um, majority in the House of Commons that they can pretty much force these uh, proposals through. Um, but you know, if you take at face value what they're telling uh, the victims and survivors groups that have met with them, and I've met with them several times, and they're saying that you know, the government's in, in listening mode, nothing's uh, predetermined, you know, we're going to 
talk about it and everyone to come up and see what happens. And to be quite frank with you, we've been talking about these things uh, since way before uh, Dennis Bradley got involved in it. I mean, I was involved in, in, in the very first consultation in 2002 uh, with the Healing Through Remembering Report. So we're talking and we're talking and we're talking. And I suppose what, what happens whenever um, Northern Irish society doesn't come forward with ideas of their own, well, then I think you give uh, ownership of that over to the British government and that's why they come and then they can force through these proposals. So I don't know if this can be opposed, but if they are genuine about saying that they're in listening mode and everybody, everybody bar the veterans uh, are telling them that these are wrong, so, uh, and these so are give, moral, then they need to listen. So what do you think, if, if you had an open line to Boris Johnson and Brandon Lewis, what do you say to them tonight? I would say go back to the Stormont House Agreement, um, you know, and the legacy proposals within it. I mean, every time we've gone to the table, and you, you go from uh, from Dennis Bradley and Robin Eames' report right through the House of Sullivan to the Stormont House Agreement, and every time we go back to the drawing board, we come back, we come away with considerably less than what we had before. Um, so you know, the idea is not about, there's no ideas out there. Uh, you know, what we need is implementation. We need somebody to stand up and actually to do this. Um, and, and it can happen. I mean, Nuala's absolutely right. I, uh, we work with the Canova Inquiry very closely, and we know that that's a model that's working for families. We absolutely know that. So if something is working, today, uh, with the pension uh, being open for victims, is another aspect of legacy which is working. So it's not to say that these things don't work. Um, it's about the will, uh, and if the will's there, uh, then I believe that they will find a way. But these current proposals are, in my view, just immoral. Dennis Bradley, to go back to yourself, the British government talks about you know this becoming intergenerational, moving down the generations. Something needs to be done that continues legacy to poison and to, to keep people apart. Um, but isn't there a, a big danger now that if they, these proposals do go through, that there'll be a lot of legal cases will be mounted? Well, that's a possibility. Uh, I, I, I'm, I've been around this a long time. I'm, I'm confused to taste by, by what happens. Uh, I mean, I don't know if Canova actually delivers either. From this point of view, I don't know if it will get through the DPP. I don't know if anybody will end up in jail over, over something that's been quite horrific within our society. And the other, there are new proposals coming through Canova, which I think are very important which are to do with uh, themes. I mean, sometimes we talk as if these are all individual things, but a lot of the stuff that has happened in the, in the narrative and in the terrible history that we have been through over 30, 40 years have to do with themes, you know, about collusion on one hand, uh, about border situations where people feel that there was genocide happening. There are themes running through all this which are which are out and beyond just the individual uh, and that I think that we have to learn from. Now I think if we could theme some of this stuff along with uh, with, with with the recovery of, of as much information and truth as possible. Dennis, the Dennis, I'm going to have to stop you there and give the last word to yourself, Nola, this evening. In terms of what, uh, what Dennis has just been, been well, saying, he, you know, there's some disparity between the two of you on the way forward. Yeah, it, can I just say one thing? In terms of information recovery and truth-telling, we will not be able to tell the whole story because as soon as you name someone as having been involved in, a, in an atrocity, um, they will bring legal action to stop you because you, the, the evidence has not been tested. So there are going to be defamation actions, there are going to be judicial reviews, there's going to be all sorts of things. The information recovery is not a simple process and it's not going to be simple unless those who recover it have the powers.